Okay, well, it's two minutes past 11. Um, so I would like to, to make a start and welcome you all. Um, so this is a webinar for showing, going through the best Microsoft compliance tools that you have never heard of. My name is Mark Warnes. I'm an architect um, up here at Coach Show within our secure digital transformation practice. Um, and we deal with helping organizations to um, implement a lot of the technologies within the Microsoft 365 suite, in particular for me, the compliance tools that we're going to speak about today. I'm going to pass you over to introduce himself to my colleague, Mark. Hi, all. My name's Mark Dennis. I've been working in around data protection and information governance since 1998. I arrived in this space pretty much at the same time as the original Data Protection Act um, and pretty much had the same amount of impact, really. Um, so my job today is to talk about the regulatory and um, governance issues and challenges that we all face. Okay, before we begin, um, just some quick housekeeping. Um, we are recording this webinar, so you can play it back um, if you uh, want to uh, listen again to some of the stuff we're going to introduce. If you have any questions during the, the webinar, then obviously in the, the GoToWebinar tools, you can, can ask a question there. And if um, we have time at the end, we will look to address that or, or follow up after the meeting if we, if we run out of time. Um, also, if you have any problems during, there is also the chat window there. Someone will be monitoring it, um, the questions and um, chat throughout the, um, the webinar. So if we're able to respond straight away, we will. Um, so please do enter something there if you need to. In which case, I'm going to move on to the next slide and hand over to Mark. As you are all painfully aware, um, we have a world that is driven by compliance and regulation. We've got a lot of statutory and, ind and industry-driven regulations, um, obviously the General Data Protection Act, um, the Data Protection Act of 2018, and the Misuse of Computers Act, privacy regulations, and at some point we're going to see um, the new e-privacy regulations in some form appear from the EU that will be probably rolled into our Data Protection Act. We've also got to deal with things like NIST, obviously the North American standards, um, credit and debit card payments through things like PCI DSS, um, and then standards to work to the likes of Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, ISO 27001. And if you work within the NHS or provide service in the NHS or health services, then the DSP toolkit. And also we need to remember the likes of the Financial Conduct Authority um, and the Information Commissioner of, Office oversee a lot of this type of stuff. Fundamentally, we all operate in a regulated environment now, and we have to accept that. But from a data protection officer compliance perspective, we have to ensure that we have corporate policies, processes, ideally internal and external audit, ongoing assurance, training and education of staff, breach incident management, and obviously dealing with the rights of the individual subject access requests. Fundamentally, we need as much visibility as we can possibly get, and this is what Microsoft can deliver for you. Your users, as ever, these are the content creators, the data handlers and processors, the information asset owners and administrators who are sharing contact, content, sometimes passwords, working collaboratively. We've got home working now driven by COVID, multi-organization working. And we need to help these users as much as we possibly can to ensure they are safe and secure. Your board. Well, now, you know, it's really been noticeable the last couple of years that board and senior management teams are looking to get confidence and understanding that they're operating a compliant, safe business and that's fit for purpose. So part of our collective role is to provide that assurance in many ways, in many forms. And we basically need to exploit all the tools we have at our disposal to manage these challenges. So why bother? Well, cost. Um, when data protection fails, it is never, ever, ever cheap to fix. Um, the cost of successful ransomware breach is quite staggering at times and difficult to rectify and often goes on for a very extended period of time. And in many cases, the cyber insurance will not cover this. It is almost always cheaper to address the challenge than try and deal with the outcome. So reputation, well, reputational damage is significant. We've only got to think back over the last few years to some bigger examples like British Airways, Talk Talk, many other examples across the world. Um, you know, that reputational damage stays for a long time. Um, it puts the business under a lot of scrutiny. It gives a cost to the business. Um, and it can be substantial, particularly if the ICO um, decide to prosecute for negligence. Um, 
We really need to ensure that we're not negligent at any point. Risk identification keeps you safe. Again, staff, um, something I often kind of harp on about a little bit, but you know, do not underestimate the impact on your staff members if this goes wrong, particularly if they're a good person, good employee who made a simple mistake on a simple transaction that led to some a breach or an incident. We have a duty of care. We need to protect those users as much as we possibly can. Data subjects. We have a legal responsibility, you're all painfully aware of this, to look after the data and the rights of all data subjects, including clients, staff, board members, the general public. We must meet our responsibilities. It's a legal requirement. In our experience over the last 20 odd years, it always costs more to fix than to maintain like any other system on the planet. So, how does the Microsoft world help here? Well, um, there's an extensive data protection information governance tool set in there, which helps hugely across the piece for all of us. So the information protection and governance, we can safeguard sensitive data across clouds, apps, and endpoints. This supports the principles of the GDPR, the Data Protection Act, um, helps meet compliance with the PCI DSS, FCA regulation, and the DSP toolkit, supports Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, and also supports ISO 27001, the technical and procedural controls that sit within Annex A. It protects both the end user and your data, which is particularly important. Risk management. What we need to remember is that the ICO in particular expects us to identify risk and manage it. It understands that we can't always fix every risk, but we need to manage them. So we need to identify, remediate critical risks within your organization. And again, Microsoft can provide templates, reports, alerts and notifications, audit trails, standard metrics. And really the key thing here is the provision of visibility control and ultimately insurance and that associated risk reduction. So managing our compliance, assess compliance and respond to regulated requirements. Um, we can provide compliance visibility through the dashboards and through various report formats and standard templates. This can provide assurance to the board and external holders, ex and, you know, just stakeholders, but external audits, auditing organizations. We can provide comparable metrics for things like GDPR, for NIST. And ultimately it involves the whole of the business. Because as we all collectively know, anybody who's working in the data protection role is, it's very difficult to get the business on board and involved on a day-to-day -day basis with these types of activities. So Microsoft can help root those activities, those outputs to the right people. Ultimately, protects the business, your staff, and your clients. So thanks, Mark. I'm going to take over now. And where I'd like to take you through is those three pillars um, of tools that Microsoft make available. So I'm going to start with information protection and governance. And there's a few good tools in here that, that are really useful um, to help protect your data. The first one is data classification. The data classification tool within the Microsoft 365 um, tool set helps you understand what types of data you've got um, and where they sit within things like SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange and Teams. Um, and data classification includes um, various detectors um, that help you spot what type of that data is. So there are things in Microsoft 365 called sensitive information types. And these are basically out of the box um, uh, detector, uh, detection definition, if you like, that will help you find things like credit card numbers or passport numbers or national identity numbers, things like that. There's, there's over 200 of them available that, that Microsoft have developed for you to provide. And using those, it will spot how many of these things or how many of these, how many documents match these types of information um, and allow you to drill down through uh, an area under data classification called the Content Explorer, find those locations where this stuff is sitting. So filter down by these particular data types and say, right, I've got X amount of, of content in this particular SharePoint site. You can drill right down and even preview the file if, if you need to go in that far. As well as the out of box types, you're able to create your own custom types as well. So if you're specific for your own organization, and again, data classification will then detect what documents match up to those. And again, you can filter down. So you can use things like keywords um, or, or long lists of keywords, which is known as dictionaries, or regular expressions, which is uh, like a 
uh, a character string of, of numbers and letters um, in a sort of fixed format um, that you're able to say, well, I'm not sure what, what the, uh, the the actual characters are, but I know I'm going to get, say, for example, two letters and then um, a string of six numbers, then that refers to our contract number or an employee ID, for example. Um, again, you're able to set up these things to, to, to spot what sort of information is sensitive to your organisation. Also, with with um, with a higher li license level, um, you have things called the trainable identifiers, which are uh, machine based learning type detectors that look more at the structure of documents rather than actually the, the specific content. So it can be good at looking for things like forms or CVs or or invoices or contracts that, that have a set format and structure. Um, and again, it's, it's something you can use and, and train up yourself and on your own data and create your own custom ones. Um, to find where your sensitive data sit. And this all sits within data classification, which gives you a, a good dashboard to, to summarize where things are and, and dig deeper as you need to. A lot of the tools um, or the information that you get from data classification can help you really then build up what a data classification schema might look like. And that's where information protection product comes in. This is where you are able to classify um, and apply a what's called a sensitivity label to your documents or your um, emails. Um, and these help you to, or help your users to identify certainly, you know, what is what is the sensitive content I have and, and apply this classification on it. And it's a flexible um, schema. You, you define what labels you want to have available. Um, you might have things like you know, public, general, confidential, highly confidential um, as a set of a simple, simple example there. And your users are able to apply them within the Office apps, such as Word, Excel and, and Outlook, for example. Um, and that means you can build up this picture again of what your sensitive data is. But not only can you apply that classification label, but if you configure it, you can actually apply that the label also encrypts the document um, so that it is only accessible to authorised users. That means that even if that document were to be sent outside your organisation, outside of your network or um, got put on a USB stick and dropped in the car park, whoever picks that up or, or has finds that they have this file sent to them, unless they are an authorised user, they won't be able to access it still because it has that protection on. You, you don't have to use protection, um, that protection, you can just use um, labels, but for your, your sensitive stuff, your really um, crown jewel type data or the stuff that you really do need to protect, it is, it is a good idea to do that. And it does mean that, as I say, authorized users only you can go in. Um, you can also automate some of this application. So users can manually apply these labels if they know what which label they need to apply. But using those sensitive, sensitive information types that we've mentioned in data classification, then as people are, are typing their document, um, if the label has been configured to say, I'm looking for a particular sensitive info type, I might be looking for a credit card number, for example, um, in this Excel spreadsheet that you're, you're putting in. If I spot that, I know that my confidential label has been configured to say, ah, I'm looking for credit, confid um, credit card numbers. Therefore, I'm going to recommend that this is the label you need to apply, or even actually I am going to apply that label for you. So the user doesn't have to do it. The system almost does it for them because it's detected what content's in there. It's a really powerful tool to help your users, as I say, classify data themselves or as they are creating it. And again, data classification will pick up the labels, the sensitivity labels that you've added to your documents. And again, allow you to drill down or look at that overview of where stuff is within SharePoint, OneDrive, et cetera, to be able to say, this is where these files are with this particular classification label on. Another good side of having the labels on and also these sensitive information types is that it helps feed into the data loss prevention tool. And data loss prevention is all about stopping your sensitive information being accessed or being sent out and overshared from, um, from the applications within of 365 or from your, from your endpoint devices. And it traditionally sort of came from, from email services and it's about being able to detect what's, hap what's inside a particular message, um, whether it be the message itself or any attachment that's been added to it spot if something sensitive is in there so maybe we're looking for credit card numbers again and spot that there's something in here and then taking action on that that might be notifying the user that um, 
this this has got something in that shouldn't perhaps you sent this by accident even blocking the the message going so it can't get out um or potentially going through an approval cycle to say actually i'm going to send it to an approver who can then approve the message going uh, lots of other actions available depending on, on what um, what service you're, you're going through it, as i say it came from email but it also extends to other areas of microsoft 365 now because if you're using sharepoint and you're sharing documents using sharepoint links it can apply those sort of similar controls there as well to say okay i've spotted there's something in here so you're not able to share this document outside of the organization for example you may try but the link won't work um, and also the data loss prevention if you have again the higher licenses you can actually start doing things on the endpoints themselves and you may be able to prevent things like um, printing happening if, if someone is working on a particularly sensitive document or with a particular classification then then you stop that happening or you can stop an upload to a cloud service um, or or even a copying to a usb stick um, so those are all data loss prevention tools within within that suite that help to control where you, what's happening to that sensitive data and putting the controls in place to stop it happening if you don't want it to or raising alerts if necessary looking at the governance side of your information there's data lifecycle management and this is about looking at what data you have and seeing do i need to retain it or delete it um, or and or delete it a lot of data when your users create this these files it often goes stale quite quickly you know it's got, got a limited lifespan really in terms of if its relevance or importance but having all this data sort of hanging around opens you up to more compliance risk because you've got data that you potentially should be shouldn't be holding on to for too long or you've got data that you you are supposed to hold on to depending on your regulations you've got to make sure you've got it for that time before you can then allow it to be deleted so data life cycle management is all about applying retention labels or retention policies in your in the Microsoft 365 area to be able to make sure that you are holding on to the files if, as you need to based on whatever schedules are appropriate for the regulations or the industry you're in um, and if necessary hold it for a period of time and delete it automatically at the end if it needs to go at that point to make sure you're not hanging around with stuff and, and, and holding on to something that you shouldn't still be holding on to related to that is then the the records management piece which is similar controls in terms of data lifecycle management but also adds some extra stuff so it's about those those files within your um, your environment where you need to mark it as a record where you need to say this is not supposed to change so yes i've got retention on this i need to hold it for a certain period of time but while it's being held it's not supposed to change either it's something i have to hold on to as a record and can mark it as such so the records management piece allows you to do that also allows you to define this central um, file plan which is basically the, the the whole schedule of all the retention and uh, periods that relate to different types of records or different types of files and documents um, also includes um, the ability to give have audit audited disposals so when you are having a disposition review as well of, of something something comes up for for disposal then it may go to a particular team to be reviewed to say right is this appropriate for deletion now okay it might pass to another team you can have multi-stage reviews but eventually you get to a point where the reviewer can say okay what do i need to do i can delete it i will let it go for deletion now or actually we need to hold on to this for a bit longer based on what it is and therefore i could apply another retention label onto it to hold on to it for a bit longer and then it will come back to review again later this is all evidenced and audited so you can show that you are disposing of records correctly and the final piece um, within this sort of area is is actually an old uh, actually not an old sorry it's, it used to be what was known as azure purview the microsoft compliance tools and tools are now called microsoft purview as a whole um, so these are the those previous tools known as Azure Peer Review have come in, um, and they allow you to extend this classification and labeling of data um, out to your hybrid sources, so your um, Azure-based databases or systems, or even some like AWS. Um, so other third-party systems as well, it can reach into to look at databases and say, okay, in a col particular column of data, I may have be able to identify that. Oh, look, here's my uh, my credit card numbers again or my um, national id number 
and I can therefore say, yes, it's, I've got a database that's got that kind of information in. I can actually apply the sensitivity labels from information protection onto that data source as well to say, I've got something here which I want to label as confidential because I know it's got this type of information in it. And those labels pass through if you take those data out and bring it out into say something like Power BI to then start reporting on things. If you've got data consumers doing that, then that label can travel with it to say, okay, as a whole, the Power BI report should be confidential because it's got some confidential label data in there. So being able to um, pass a lot of that information about classifications and labeling into your um, hybrid data sources uh, is really useful as well to keep on top of where your data is and help protect it. So let's look at the risk management side of things. Um, one of the key tools in here is the tool called Insider Risk Management. And this is a, a tool that you can set up various scenarios to look for risky behavior. Um, it basically gets triggered for a particular event that you're looking for. So you might trigger this on something like a data loss prevention policy where you're saying some sensitive information has been sent out. I wasn't expecting that to be sent out. Inside a risk management then takes a look at that event and looks at the context around that to say, what was the behavior leading up to that event? What was the user downloading lots of information? Um, or doing something that looks a bit suspicious. What were they doing after the event? Did they carry on doing that? And what it's like looking to do is create that picture of, is there a suspicious behavior going on here? Is this something that where someone might be trying to exfiltrate, um, exfiltrate data out of the organization? Are they trying to do something that they shouldn't be doing according to our policies? So do we need to take further action to investigate this and possibly notify other teams about what should be done around this? Um, so it's, it's not monitoring all the time, it gets triggered and then it allows you to monitor um, the particular activities of, of the, the user is under, cons uh, under consideration and under investigation. Um, but it allows you to spot if people are doing stuff that might be, might be deemed risky and could put your organization at risk. Slightly related to that, um, but specifically around your messaging systems is the communications compliance tool and that's looking at your emails uh, it's looking at teams messages skype for business if you're still using that and yammer for example and where it's looking is about what can we do with um or what, what's happening with the messages that are going between um, my users um, and even being sent externally are we seeing evidence of inappropriate language or, or language that might be deemed as, as harassment or threat in some way? Um, are we seeing oversharing of sensitive information? Again, going back to those information types that we talked about before on data classification. And you know, based on obviously your company policies around, you know, what, what do we want to do with if we see this sort of stuff? Um, communications compliance can monitor that, and it's reviewed by um specific specific reviewers that you determine um, but it allows you to keep an eye on that and to if necessary investigate further if someone is violating one of your policies and potentially send them a notification to say are you aware that this message has breached our policy could you you know remind yourself on what the, the corporate policy actually is um, if there's repeat alerts then you can look to um, escalate that further and potentially move it on to to the next course of action um, but it's all about remediating those risks that happen from people communicating all the time and sending inappropriate stuff through the, your messaging systems. One of the things communication clients also can look for and one of the scenarios it's able to look at is what's called the, like the conflict of interest scenario. If you've got two teams that are talking between each other that shouldn't be talking. So from, from a communication compliance perspective, it doesn't stop that but it would flag that it's happening. So you could say that you shouldn't be doing this because you're, you're supposed to have like a business separation. Um, so just to remind you, you should be doing that. But related to that then is the information barriers product. And this actually prevents that communication. So again, if you have two groups of users that have to be set apart for, for business separation reasons or for conflict of interest reasons, then you can configure this information barrier between them so that they cannot share emails or messages between those two um, sets of users um, and this actually does put the control in place to say no you're not doing it so whereas communication compliance would note that it's happening and then you would then uh, potentially notify them say please stop that information barriers actually stops it stops it flat and so useful if you need to make sure you've got groups of users that shouldn't be communicating um, together 
the e-discovery tools are really useful for um, <clears throat> analyzing the data you have within um, your Microsoft 365 area. Um, so it's about identifying the information that you need to look for, preserving it if necessary while you're doing an investigation, doing the analysis on what you've what you found from the various searches to make sure you can rule out stuff that isn't um, relevant in your particular search, and then exporting the data if necessary, all in response to any particular legal discovery request or subject access request, for example. So e-discovery tools are, are all around being able to discover what's, what's inside your Microsoft 365 environment. One thing I will say about e-discovery is it is only looking at Microsoft 365. It's, it's only within the realms of SharePoint on um, OneDrive, <clears throat> Teams and, and Exchange for email. But the beauty of your compliance um, center and the, the tools within Microsoft is you can import other information. So, for example, if you had a corporate LinkedIn account or a, a workplace for Facebook, for example, again, there's a certain you know, channel of communication going on there that you might need to use as an investigation or might be something that potentially has something relevant to a subject access request so what you can do is on a regular basis import that into the microsoft 365 compliance area it essentially stores it within exchange but again then you have e-discovery to be able to um, investigate and pull out that data if you are made subject to a, a request to, to search for this and so you're able to import things from other sources as well. There's lots of connectors within Microsoft 365 that can bring in other data sources. You might have Bloomberg messages, for example, is another one, um, where you might need to hold on to that data for, for even retention purposes, for example. Import it in and then you've got it available to search. Other area around risk management is looking about what your and potentially what users and admins are doing if they are if changes are being made or if you need to go back to check um, not not watching all the time but if something's come up as part of a discovery you need to say what happened you know what an email went or, or some document was downloaded can i check who did that well the audit records allow you to go back and look and see well what was happening is there something that happened by a particular user or particular admin and speaking of admins there are two kind of other um, areas within risk management that can help you prevent that kind of privileged access that's happening um, by by admin users or even Microsoft uh, users. So privileged access management is about those particular admin roles that people can have within the Microsoft 365 world. So for example, someone who's administering things in, in Exchange, for example, in your email system, then what privileged access management does is allow you to only give them those roles when they actually need it at that time. So their account doesn't normally have that role associated, but they ask for an approval for it, it goes into the system, the approval is made, and then they gain that right to be able to go and do what they need to do within Exchange, for example, to go and um, make a configuration change or whatever. Um, and then once they've done that, the role gets taken away again. So they don't have what's called standing access to that role. They don't have that permission all the time, which is helps make sure that they only, you know, you're limiting the risk that your um, your user could could cause because they don't have that access all the time. So looking for, you know, might be making mistakes while they've got that role, well, it helps to eliminate that too. And for customer lockbox, that's from any particular Microsoft support engineers who may need to come in and help um, look at a problem. If you've got a problem, you've raised a support ticket. But you want to protect your environment still because you may have some sensitive information hanging around. Um, and you don't want any old person from Microsoft coming in. So what, again, what you're giving them is this just-in-time access. You basically, they will ask if they need to come into your system, they will ask you for permission to come in. And Customer Lockbox handles that request and you're able to say, yes, I approve it because I know you're, you're supporting this ticket. So the Microsoft support engineer has the, the rights to come in, do what they need to do to look around, to check things, um, potentially fix the issue if, if they need to do something. But then that role, that right gets taken away again at the end. So again, they don't have that standing access. They've only got the access just in time for what they need to do to cover the, um, the support ticket they're looking at. And you're protecting your environment and eliminating those risks. That third pillar um, is com compliance management. And there's only really one tool inside this, and it is called the Compliance Manager. Um, but it's a really useful tool for measuring your progress in terms of, of what compliance things you need to, or regulations or standards that you need to adhere to. 
Um, what it is, is this dashboard basically with, which shows you a nice um, compliance score. So it gives you a nice measurable number about how you're doing. Um, but also what's perhaps more useful is it gives you all the um, details of the particular actions and controls that you might need to be implementing to, uh, um, to satisfy a particular regulation. So for example, if you are looking to satisfy ISO 27001, you can bring in that, that particular assessment within this tool um, to say, right, here are all the controls. Um, I automatically can pick up that you can match some of these. So say, yes, that's fine. You've already satisfied these. But these other ones, there's work to be done. I can see that there's all these different controls that you might need to do. And it sort of give you that list of, of a lot of the, the things, the processes, the controls that you need to put in place. And within the compliance manager as well, it allows you to keep a record of how things have been implemented and upload evidence about that, um, testing, so also upload evidence of testing and to be able to say, yes, we've tested this control and it's all in place. Yes, we've satisfied it. So you've got the evidence there that you've done so. So you need to send a report out to an, an auditor to see how well you've been doing or what your compliance um, against ISO 27001 looks like at the moment. You can do that easily from this tool. Just download the report and it will say this is these are all the dates that we did the implementation plan and the testing and everything and when we satisfied this. Um, there are lots of assessments available within Compliance um, Manager. There's a number of free ones available. ISO 27000 is one. Uh, I think NIST is one as well. Um, there's also a standard one that Microsoft provide called the Data Protection um, Baseline, um, which is a kind of amalgamation of a lot of sensible controls from things like um, NIST and ISO, uh, but also from CIS. Um, the other security one as well. So there's a lot of good stuff in there about helping you to maintain the security and compliance of your uh, Microsoft 365 environment. But there are also a load of premium assessments. So some of the more, um, more niche or specialist um, assessments and regulations and standards that you might need to do, they are not free, they are, they are paid for. And so, but there, there is a massive list of them and it's worth having a look if there's a particular a requirement that you need to try and adhere to. You can actually also upload your own custom assessments. Um, you can build up a, a, an Excel template basically to populate the controls you need to do, import that. And again, it's a way of tracking um, about how things are being done, how what actions are being managed by particular teams. You can actually assign actions to different users. So it's not just IT that can do this, you can share this between other teams who may need to be involved in meeting a particular requirement and pass off the responsibility for a particular action to them. And they are able to then access this to upload any particular evidence or mark off saying, yes, this has now been done because we've got the proof to show it. Um, so it's a really good tool for staying on top of your, your compliance journey as a whole in terms of what things you need to put in place. and if these assessments get updated, so if regulations do get updated time to time, then the compliance manager will also sh notify you or show you that there's some updates happened here. So, you know, this may change your posture. You can add, apply those updates. You can see where things have changed, um, whether that changes the, your overall score or if there are new actions that are coming that you need to do. So it allows you to really stay on top of, of everything you need to do to, to stay on top of a, um, a particular assessment. So that's my kind of fly through the, the various tools that are in there. But as you can see, there's, there's quite a lot of them to do. So where we, what we would normally recommend for doing things like this is to look at considering a more iterative approach. We call it our compliance success pathway. Um, so rather than going from A to B and, and do all these tools at once and, and try and do all the features, which you can imagine takes a lot of effort and it's quite a lot of change for your users to take in all at once. We look to do a more iterative approach and build up your, um, your compliance posture in cycles. So we would always start with a, a foundation cycle, as we call it, where you, you look and say, right, what are, our, what are our particular priorities? What do we need to, what regulations do we need to adhere to? What are we, what are we concentrating on this, this period? Um, and start implementing those technologies in a, um, maybe not to their fullest capacity, but putting in the, the, the right features that work for you at this point to get you started, to get your users used to some of the controls that might come along. Because some of these things are quite user impacting, they require the user to do something. So for example, with data labeling, so that's sensitivity labels. 
um, it takes <clears throat> a bit for your users to get the idea of, OK, I'm, I'm changing my habits here in terms of what I have to do, or there are controls now being put in place that may affect my way of working in terms of I have to be aware that I can't just send this out now because it might be blocked if I if I have too much of this information in, for example. So it's bringing in these technologies in, in a way that the users can, can understand and allow it to be adopted by your users so that they are comfortable with it and can embed it into their ways of working, but also understand their ways of working to make sure you're putting in those, those controls in a way that's appropriate. But if you do that in your foundation cycle, you have built up your, your foundation for future improvements. So when we move to our next cycle, we are looking to add some of those advanced capabilities. We might be bringing in some of more of the automation features I talked about. So detecting automatically when content has sensitive stuff in, um, documents have sensitive comp content in, so therefore applying a label automatically, for example. Um, so there the other advanced features that you can bring in over and above what you had in your foundation. And so that's starting to improve your posture. You can see in the foundation, we, you, you'll find that you have a very quick sharp improvement in your compliance posture because you are introducing these these technologies you, if you haven't introduced any of them before um, but then in the advance although your progress might slow down a bit it's because you've done so well in that initial phase but you are still improving you're improving that posture because you are bringing in some of these new capabilities to help protect your organization and any future cycles beyond that we call our optimized cycles which is where you are any new capabilities that might come along, any new features, um, even new products, because Microsoft do develop this stuff all the time, um, you can introduce those um, on top of what you've had before. So you're always building on what you've had before. You're always looking to improve your compliance posture. So the benefits really of having that kind of iterative approach is you are able to adapt to any shifting priorities within your business or within the regulations that you have to adhere to and if there are any changes in the risk landscape that, that become aware you know you become aware of or Microsoft um, flag to you from what they've seen from all the telemetry they have then you're able to be quite um, agile around this and um, you know it doesn't stop your journey halfway through if you're taking the A to B approach because you're taking steps to this you are able to you know you've what your work you've done before is still absolutely valid and in your next cycle you're able to adapt that because of things have changed as i mentioned you know products are always changing there's new features being added so they may address a challenge that you had that you weren't able to address before but now this feature enhancement has come along and says ah that does address the challenge now and so with a change of a uh, slight change of configuration or introducing that extra enhancement that then allows um, us to address our, our risk and if you have a particular budget around your um, implementing these sort of controls or, or looking to introduce this to your users then by having an iterative approach you can work within that budget quite well you know you're not looking to you can make as much progress as you can with with what's available to you in that particular budgetary cycle and then next cycle um, you can say well we've had all this before we can now add a bit more and still remain within our budget and take control of what we're doing but really show that clear progression along our compliance journey so from a compliance success pathway point of view, we have a roadmap. Um, we would always look at try and help you have, have this roadmap. It may not look exactly like this, <clears throat> but it really kind of covers, and we split it down a bit more from the, the, the key areas that, that the Microsoft tools have, as you can see at the top. We we'll break it down a little bit more um, just to give you a bit more granularity. And the order of these may change. Um, what doesn't change really is the initiation and baseline at the front, because that needs to happen up front. But the order of the other stuff depends on again your priorities and, and you find that out as when you sit down and have a discussion about what are what are our priorities this time so do we need to be looking at data protection first or actually data governance needs to come up for more because that's more important to us at this point in time in this particular cycle so if we then not go through our iterative cycles if you're putting in a foundation first of all you start off um, with really the initiation about you know doing that discovery piece about what, what licenses do we have because there are various um, features that might require a higher license to what you, you have at the moment but you can get a lot of value out of your existing licenses a lot of the tools i've talked about will work at, say the the e3 level of licenses without requiring anything more so there's a lot of things you can do and put in place that will really improve your compliance posture in your initiation you're also identifying those regulations and requirements that you have that you need to adhere to and whenever we do a baseline, we are looking at what your current posture is. 
we're looking to define those priorities and develop the roadmap to go forward. So we can you can see like for this cycle, what we what do we need to do? What are we trying to achieve? What are our particular priorities? That helps us define what that that roadmap looks like. And so in the foundation, we are enabling our technologies in an, in an initial configuration. And say so it may not it not not always super basic. There will be some stuff good stuff going in there because you can make advances quite quickly. But you may not turn on all the features straight away because that is a lot to embed with your users all at once. So if we do an initial configuration, we make sure that it's balanced enough that your users can help adapt. Um, and also you're establishing what other processes need to be around this. You know, how do you respond to particular alerts? How do you respond to um, data loss events if, if we're spotting that certain things are happening? So putting those kind of operate processes in place to help you manage your risk and, and stay on top of it. We move to the next cycle, the advanced cycle, then we would always look at rebaselining to make sure where we're at. Can we check our, our progress? Has anything changed from a um, regulation point of view or a priority point of view? But then in this cycle, you were revising the configurations that you had before, adding those additional capabilities if there are, are things that have added that um, you didn't add first time that you can now add because now we're, we're users are comfortable and refine any other processes that you might put in place. And then for any ongoing optimized cycles, again, you would always look to baseline to identify if there are any changes to regulation priorities. Um, but then you are steadily, depending on what's come along, reviewing what you've had before. If there's any new features or capabilities that look like they would be useful, then you could add them in um, and continuously refining those processes. A lot of the front heavy work is kind of done at the foundation and advanced level. Your optimize is a lot lighter and because you've done most of the work already so it becomes light so that's our kind of approach or recommended recommended approach really to starting to or moving along your compliance journey to put things in place um, if you want any more information um, about that particular approach our compliance success pathway then obviously do get in touch um, or if you're after specific details about some of those individual technologies that i talked about and of course do do still please reach out that'd be great to hear from you we'd be happy to to have a chat um, so that brings me to the end. Um, thank you very much. And if you have any questions that you wanted to raise, then please um, throw them into the chat now. We'll be happy to take them. And we should also say if, if you um, didn't want to ask a question in this forum, then we are happy if you want to reach out to us after the webinar. Um, to arrange a, a, a private um, Q&A with myself and Mark, if that's more appropriate, if you feel more comfortable that way, that's happy. We're happy to do that as well. We've actually managed to finish bang on time. Um, so I can't see any questions in the chat for now. So in which case, um, I think we can we can call it a day there then. Um, as I said, if you need to reach out afterwards, please do. Um, I'll just go back on my slide to show you on screen again the, um, the details if you want to get in touch. So our email and our phone number there. Um, but otherwise, it's thank you from me. Yeah, and thank you from me. And uh, thanks for attending and um, hope to see you again soon.